subscribers coming in. If you haven't seen or you haven't been to our website, we have events well into June. So the next couple months, you need to uh, start putting events out there further in advance. For those of you that are new, my name is Ivan Gill. I am the founding treasurer of the chapter, current president. I'm going to give a quick two-minute spiel about what we what we do and who we are. Um, the chapter was founded back in 2014, became operational the following year in 2015. Our mission is to foster the next generation of cybersecurity professionals. To that end, we hold the majority of our meetings at higher education institutions like John Tyler Community College, Virginia Commonwealth University, um, a couple other um, ECPI, ECPI, Chesapeake Technical Center, uh, and we vary the locations every month so that the membership has the chance to attend one or as many meetings as they're capable of attending. Our member base is 50% student, whether, let me say, let me phrase that. 50% of our members are students. Out of the 50%, 25 are in high school, like at the Chesterfield Technical Center, and the other 25% are at local educational institutions, uh, like John Tyler, Virginia Commonwealth University. Towards that end, the second 50% of our membership is their professional, whether they're in cybersecurity or in another IT related field and are looking to get into cyber, we're here to foster that transition. To that end, half of the meeting, we have a two hour meeting, the last Thursday of every month, half of the meeting is dedicated to an educational component, such as a presentation that you're going to see here tonight. The other half, uh, we put aside 15 to 20 minutes for a stump the chop Jeffrey style question and answer event at questions that are related to one of the ISC square tests. And the remaining of the meeting is dedicated to chapter um, event or related news and networking. So that's my two minute spiel. Any questions? All right. Without further ado, I'd like to introduce Peter Tesenega and Dudley Bowman. Um, they are going to present tonight on IT controls, cyber, and third party risk management. Uh, I'd like to give them a big welcome. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you both for agreeing to present. Absolutely. Thanks for having us. Appreciate it. Uh, so again, I'm, I'm Dudley Bowman, and before uh, we get started talking about IT controls and vendor management, I uh, wanted to quickly introduce ourselves. Uh, so again, I'm Dudley Bowman, um, as you introduced Goodman. Uh, I am a senior consultant and uh, the risk advisory services um, division, and currently focus on audit and IT risk advisory uh, for public and private companies and uh, public companies. Uh, so that's me in a nutshell. And uh, my colleague here is Peter Chingis. Thank you, Dobbin. Uh, it's nice to be here tonight. Thanks again uh, to Ivan and everyone for allowing us to come speak to you I see some familiar faces. Uh, it's good to see Chandis again. Uh, I've been with uh, the for about five years now. I'm the manager of the advisory team here in this uh, base downtown. Uh, the office here are from kind of uh, East Coast based companies. Uh, Accounting and, and tax services, you know, they've been kind of building up this side of the tax over the last several years. Um, you know, I'm a manager with a group and focus on uh, everything from state government, IT security assessments, business impact assessments, assessment, and planning efforts, uh, systems development, uh, <coughs> assessments, and then everything also on the non state government side, so like things like on stock IT, uh, anything kind of in that IT security. IT Thank you for coming. Hopefully, it's going to go ahead. Great, thanks, Peter. So, uh, I wanted to start by talking about uh, the path we live in, which uh, 
heard some of this chatter, I, I can tell I'm going to a knowledgeable base here. Um, so this shouldn't surprise anybody, but the environment in which we live, um, specific to data breaches, um, times continue to be busy uh, for data breaches and cyber criminals. As we all know this. Um, so what I wanted to do to kick things off is to take a look at some highlights or the lowlights, if you will, of, of some recent history. Um, so I'll start at the top of the cross. So Equifax, now this, we all remember, this was uh, July 2017. And we're looking at that, that uh, by this data breach. Uh, there are 143 million uh, people compromised. That's 143 million social security numbers, full names, addresses, dates of birth, credit card numbers, and other personal information that were exposed. Uh, as you can imagine, I'm going to be to get that, uh, get that into. Moving on to Uber. Now, this is one that um, was under a lot of people's radar. Um, and it actually does go back a couple of years to 2016. 2016, hackers stole the data of over 57 million Uber uh, customers and drivers. And it was kind of kept under wraps. Um, company paid the hackers a $100,000 ransom to delete the records and cover up the breach. And this all came to light uh, a year later when there's a new CEO who was a bit of this back. So, um, as you can imagine, uh, even though they, they work with the hackers to uh, delete those records, um, there's still a, a reputational impact um, after, after that. The next one is Facebook. And Facebook, you can't seem to turn on the news or, or open up uh, you know, the web browser without getting some kind of news about Facebook. So, I will limit this to the last seven months when I'm talking about Facebook. Um, September 2018. About 90 million user accounts were compromised by hackers. It's a weakness in the line of code um, that exposed a vulnerability in Facebook's uh, View As feature, which allows users to see how their profile looks uh, to other users as well. Then in December uh, 2018, it was last December, Facebook announced a security bug that allowed third party app developers to view the private photos of uh, 6.8 million users on other side of the internet. Uh, with the internet. Nonetheless, private photos, Facebook stories, marketplace photos uh, were exposed. Going back to this last month, March, March uh, 2019, um, this one for me when I heard it as a big problem in the world. Facebook admitted that since 2012, it had not properly secured the passwords of as many as 600 million users. These passwords were stored in plain text. And what? Since, since 2012. And I just just bored me. Um, and they were accessible by more than 20,000 company employees. Um, so I'm sure there is uh, Facebook is definitely going to have to use that. And the last thing I'll say about Facebook actually just came across the line this morning on FTC. Um, had been investigating, of course, uh, these, these breaches at Facebook and announced that there will be a full thing fine in the amount of $3 billion. So as you can see, not only is there reputational impact, right, I see you shrugging because, yeah, what's that? What's that to mark? But nonetheless, um, yeah, right. but nonetheless, it's still an impact, and especially if that were to happen to a smaller outfit, they could certainly yeah. certainly put, put them on this. So you have reputational impact, and you can also have financial consequences. So great. Um, moving on to the bottom row here, I wanted to bring in um, Fortnite, which is kind of a more recent phenomenon. Um, this, the one on the, this game, uh, in 2018, hackers got a hold of personal data of children who played the game and were selling it on the dark web. Uh, scammers could purchase credentials and rack up using the credit cards in the video game. Uh, cyber criminals could also use targeted credentials to gain access to bank accounts and uh, other payment card information. It goes without saying, uh, parents should always be monitoring uh, what their children uh, are doing. Especially with um, with all of the currency uh, that's exchanged, it's getting fast. 2019 is kind of one of those same ones. Um, there's a flaw within the uh, online video game that exposed players to being hacked. And according to uh, the security firm checkpoint, a uh, threat actor could take over the account of any game player, view their personal account. Information, purchase speed box, the in game currency, and eavesdrop in game chatter. And Fortnite has over 200 million users, 80 million. Active. 
that's a that's a that's a big horn. Another only the goodie I did not want to forget is Yahoo just because of the sheer volume. Okay. Uh, they're still trying to figure out exactly how many customers were impacted by the breach in 2013. They first said uh, it could be over the uh, Then they revised the number of, of words. And the last that has come out has said, well, um, they've announced that every one of their 3 billion uh, accounts. 3 billion accounts. So, again, <coughs> Number there. And I think it's important that this that these breaches don't just occur in the business and commerce spaces, but also educational. So here's why I have to look at here. I thought this was interesting. This was under my radar. Uh, 2019, personal information of current and former faculty uh, students, staff, students, applicants uh, of Tech were accessed by a hacker through a central database. The database affected the breach, uh, the, the breach included names, addresses, the security numbers, birth dates of 1.3 million people. And this was the second breach of less than a year. Um, so it really raises concerns about the integrity of this talk and some of those. If you hadn't heard of it all, it's quite hard. So, so what does all this tell us? In short, data breaches are serious. They're not going away. Um, you can see this is from uh, Verizon's 2018 data breach in investigations report where there were over 52,000 incidents and over 2,200 confirmed data breaches. And of course, 2,200 confirmed data breaches multiplied by how many records were in confirmed data breaches. Uh, getting this kind of the spiral out of the exposure going on. Um, it's really, it's really quite a large problem. Um, so, why are we here today? Well, actually, first, before I get to that, let me, let me take you a little bit deeper inside these numbers. I thought there were some other interesting numbers here. Um, and I'll start at the left and go down here. So 73% of cyber attacks were perpetrated um, by outsiders, uh, so they were external. 28%, and this is uh, due to random, 73, 28 of the <laughs> but, uh, but 20, 28 of the attacks involved insiders. So think about that, even if we rounded up there and rounded down to 27 um, that, that's more than a quarter of these things. So from inside, uh, that, that's a little scary. Going to the middle there, 76% of all breaches were financially motivated. Not a surprise to anybody. That's one of the points that we want to talk about there. 68% uh, 68, uh, 68 of breaches took months or longer to discover. Uh, that's just half the story. Um, if you haven't had it uh, happen to you, I'm sure that you've read some accounts of people like that that have been in the story. And just a nightmare to go through, and it's not it's not a two week long process. It, it can be a year long process. So um, so while I took months or longer to discover the ramifications, the most part going on. Fifty eight percent of all victims were small businesses. So it's not just the Facebooks and the Googles and the IDs. Fifty eight percent were small businesses. I thought really was a was a uh, meaning that. Need to have uh, programs and policies and procedures in place uh, at all levels, uh, not just at the, uh, at the large corporations. And lastly, 17% uh, or almost one out of five, these breaches we do, especially through employee year uh, training. No one likes to do it. Uh, usually gets kind of shuffled off to the side, but uh, it's, it can be very important, especially if it ends up in being one of these 17%. So all, all of these are important. Um, and so what I'm going to just show with this is that uh, data breaches uh, they come from multiple sources. And they uh, are all potentially serious, no matter what the source is. Um, and they all definitely get consequences. So moving further and talking about why uh, we're here today, and what we're going to talk about before we go to these. So in this presentation, Peter and I um, are going to talk about uh, what you can do to identify risk and to help protect uh, your organization. Peter's going to start off by talking about IT internal security controls, uh, why these controls are important, and discuss different methods of how you can identify risks, but also prioritize their implementation. Uh, I think that's what we're going to talk about. 
identify as prioritizing institutions. Next, I'll discuss IT third party risk management, uh, the importance of it, and steps you can take to develop and, and ensure your business. Then we'll wrap up, discuss what we learned, um, have questions, uh, hopefully some answers, and um, that'll be the uh, Program outline for this evening. And so, with that, I will turn it over to Peter Jenkins, who will discuss IT health security controls. Thanks, Thank you. Right. Um, so, as Dudley mentioned, we kind of want to break down the discussion into two parts here. Um, you know, I'm going to kind of go through what we can do, you know, for our internal organizations to kind of cover some of the things that we're just uh, Hopefully, some of the things I'll discuss, um, you're already. Trying to implement the organization, but not to be there's some takeaways that we're going to learn So, how many of us at our organizations, you know, whether you're a new ISO coming in or, or someone who's not here, you're trying to figure out, you know, where your organization stands? A lot of times it's in one of these three levels. Uh, you know, management doesn't care. The woman just like, if I hide and put my head in the sand, the problem will go away. Then you have others that Want to spend every dollar they have because they don't know what to do and what to do. The sky is falling. And, uh, and then you got Chuck Morris over here, fully confident in you know, your organization, uh, anything from management on down, very glad on board, everybody's knowledgeable, and you have felt like a good security program and control structure in place. So, what should all organizations be asking about? Uh, we talked about you know, some of the applications and various tactical uh, impacts from different sources. You know, first and foremost, you know, are your digital organization prepared to defend against a cyber attack? Uh, you know, have you classified and identified what your system is, what your data is, so that you can apply the right control, the right resources to them? Uh, you know, where is the data located? Uh, who has access? There's internal employees that have access to your systems and your data, and then you also have third party contractors that might be hosting your system. Again, you know, that's even worse. You can't see it's in the access to your different organizations. So you make sure you have the right controls to monitor that. Um, and then also, you know, as you identify what resources you have in the organization, have you identified what the risks are, what the threats and vulnerabilities are, that you can uh, ensure that you have any hidden controls. Uh, that even feeds into Make sure you have proper internal controls. Lastly, do you have the right IP resources? Again, you can have tools and systems in place and not have the right personnel to understand how to configure those things. And you're you end up with a hot mess you know, just in terms of trying to take day management and oversight of people. So some organizations you will explain this to them and they still have that reaction of who cares? And you know, you're you're having that daily battle with them. Well, what's at risk? Dudley talked about reputation. You get hit, you end up in the news. People lose trust and faith in you. They go somewhere else. Or they have more uh, confidence in your data and your secure location. Cross your test about the source of data. That's the reason why you would have the reputation. Failure to comply with regulatory requirements. You hear about regulatory requirements every single day. Try to figure out what's going to apply to your organization and Trying to implement the right controls and solutions. The reasons those are important, not just from the security control, but cost and fees and penalties. You get assessments done and if you realize you're not compliant with certain standards, you have costs associated with that. Uh, and also, you know, again, impacts and breaches you have costs associated with that as well. That's a perfect for the organization. And the other hit, you, know, you get a denial service attack on the organization. You're, if you're a company and you're telling your customers that you're on 24 7, seven days a week, uh, and your system is not getting shut down, again, they're going to lose faith in you and that risk is going to escalate. So, what can your organizations do? Kind of highlighted here, there's there's multiple, multiple ways that you can try to educate the organization. I wanted to try to really focus on some of the few things that, um, again, I talked about open things that have already been talking about. But first and foremost, yeah, foremost, getting that board and executive level support. Everything stops, starts with uh, the management. And if they're on board and they're helping you implement things you need, giving you support you need, 
Self-assessment when you're doing it, you know, within an IT group, or you actually have an internal IT shop that can come and help. They can be the greatest allies uh, in some sense because audit can make recommendations that can go to the executive management that can result in action. That's one way to think about it. They can bring me out and help that you can come and So, what this is basically showing is that. Um, with the assessment done is trying to show that you know over the years the trends are, are inching upward in terms of executive management becoming more knowledgeable, becoming more engaged, but the numbers are still low. There's still a lot of improvement and a lot of go ahead that can be made. So hopefully some of the you know I can uh, in a couple of the but even to make this application. So some things you can do to kind of work with your uh, executive team is getting them engaged in the process. Um, you know, there's the NIST standard that which in the state government is the second level one that we're involved with. It helps to kind of identify roles and responsibilities. So providing that education, keeping them in the loop, helping develop a governance model so we can define what their roles. Again, you know, that, them being involved, them understanding what the NISTs are, working that into this model can help provide those initial steps to build in this process out. Develop your security plan. Uh, we always talk about you know, strategic plans and you know, line your security plan in with that. And so again, providing that information and educating them on some of those things I talked about, the risks, the abilities, and how that works with your plan and how you can have a successful impact on your organization. Um, and then something we often see is, you know, are you providing minutes? Are you providing some kind of laws and statistics to manage you know, you from a security level might see something digested and you see that it's a big deal. Finding ways to massage that, uh, you know, every, it's going to mean something different. Than and so if you can find a way to get that information, to summarize it and get that in front of them so they can digest it and again see, oh wow, we have to go to the top here. We need to do something. You know, making sure that you know, again, you're being present at those meetings, being get a seat at the table, have a voice. That's one way to Those are always going to go into that. There's a big issue there. I just finished up a uh, cybersecurity audit uh, last year that had such an impact on the organization and you know, management was new to that. They kind of the, the head and same approach because they were just uh, communicated that, oh, we're good, we're strong, we're good. The evaluation was good. Cool. And they had about eight or nine critical findings that resulted in management changes in the IT side um, and really opened the eyes of the board and the So it has an impact. Um, so we talked about educating your board. But the next step, we want to make sure your employees are at the right level of responsibility. It's not the easiest approach to try to implement. Obviously, there's more effective ways, but you know, having a strong security rancher. I'm not talking about the, the PowerPoint deck that you can fix both times when you're done. Uh, you know, finding ways to make it cool. Uh, you know, create questions with them. Have have an interaction with them. You got to learn from you know, the people that you're really engaging. Keep it fresh. Keep it current. Uh, you know, things change. I can't say any kind of uh, you know, security really security awareness training. And it's still talking about control from 15 years ago. Like, what's, 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 
Um, but you know, they, they've made strides with this tool up there that you know, have helped us with uh, things like that. And you know, some other techniques that you know, play a key role here is social engineering, things, you know, no random dialing, providing those emails, and see how many employees you can click on. You'd be surprised if you come, I mean, down some of the triple last question you expect to click on, you know, at least it will provide that uh, insight to the organization. Um, security communication and updates. Uh, you know, I remember when I worked at the state, you know, COD would send out uh, you know, a random uh, security alert. So if something hits the news, they would try to get it out into the masses and let people know, uh, you know, either to the organization and they would funnel it out, but there'll be some kind of constant reminder that, or alert that you, know, you should be uh, staying in tune with. So that's another thing that you should subscribe to. You have a newsletter of the organization and you want to try to provide tidbits and feedback to your school. And you know, obviously, you have to uh, You don't see that as much anymore, just a good way to kind of hang things up there on the organization. So, um, this is by one of the main areas I want to stress. You know, again, we have mass amounts of servers, databases, and things of that nature. We have our divisions and business departments, and you come in and you say, Where's your data? Mm -hmm. but, you know, nobody knows. If they haven't done the exercise to go through, you're fine. If you start looking at security controls, all over the place. You have to talk about the web server. If something that's low risk has the strongest control, and then the thing that's housing, you know, uh, trade secrets or security, uh, student, social security numbers has the lowest risk. Right? So we're starting to try to, you know, Either when we do the audits or something, we'll ask those questions. We have the classification policy and that data. So we can probably identify these systems that don't do an exercise. Uh, some will do it and then they, they haven't done anything in 10 years. So they'll do it and they won't document it. So there's, there's varying degrees here. But it really is broken down into those questions. What type of system data do you have? And everybody's done a PAI, PII, PHI, uh, trade secrets, government data, those are you know, some of the common ones. That yeah, so again, just trying to figure out like, okay, we're a bank organization, we're a healthcare organization. Start asking those basic questions and then kind of figure out from there where, where should we go and then break it out. The business departments that they can talk to and work with uh, that information. Uh, classify, you know, is it confidential? It doesn't have to necessarily be just confidential, it's sensitive. Uh, you can have integrity, you know, so financial statements, reporting, so much you get into your system. And, Jumble up the numbers and you're providing a financial report. So a financial report that's misstated, you know, that could have reputational uh, availability. Again, if you're a search provider, imagine if Amazon was constantly getting hacked, you know, if you're, and more and more people own that, you know, they're, they're offline, you can't provide to your customers. So, you know, availability is that. So, you want to rank those, you know, level of time you can post. So, you want to know which system, again, that's the discussion we have. What system is using it, and then you figure out where, where that application is housed, what that database is housed. So, develop a documented inventory because it's a good tool. It's, you know, again, everybody's trying to figure out what they're going to do. They have uh, 50 symbols, but if you consolidate it and have an inventory, so here's a system, here's what we have, and again, keep it current. And, uh, you know, sometimes it takes time for the two or the larger one to use time to service things they have, or you know, databases and just how. how uh, expansive environment is it may take time to get that exercise. It won't be the first time. Getting an inventory it makes it easier to manage that. Just again, it's something you have to have. And lastly, who has access? Uh, you know, once you define the first three, then you start figuring out uh, you know, who has access to the database. So again, you might find out quickly you, know, you have done an access review, and there are people that don't even aren't even at the company. Um, obviously, there's to mitigate control of the network access, that's the link, but they find that door, it's the data. External, you know, again, you're providing your information to a third party. You want to make sure you're staying on your own as best as you can. Who has access? If people leave those organizations, they don't come back and tell you, oh, so and so left three months ago. You're like, well, I can still have access to that system. That's important to identify. And then physically, um, 
obviously more and more infrastructure is going to be on more days properties, but we still want to know the toilets, elements of house. Hey, Peter. Yeah, one question. So, my dad, governance manager, actually brought this up during his presentation at the COB conference. And it's kind of an interesting question that I've been trying to think about. When do you ever have an opportunity where your integrity of your data is never hot? Because if you have a system and you want to make sure your data is always the right data in that system, when is it never high? It should always be high. In most cases, yeah, absolutely. Uh, you know, because again, you know, if, there, if ever it was something that's low, I didn't in that system, the lower scale, but yeah, you're right. In most cases, the degree should be high. Even if it's, you, know, you always hear the oh, financial system is there, not central. No, it needs to be it needs to be accurate completely. Um, well, I would say for us in like the dev environment, we don't take care of it. Right. right. Depends on what you're using. I mean, obviously, you're hoping you're using the yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's, that's why the integrity doesn't matter. Yeah. So, yeah, you're right. In those particular cases, we would take care of it. Yeah, in theory, most of your prods should be uh, All right, so we classified our data. Now we need to identify what this is. Again, here, you want to know what's the risk. So that's one of the ways. We've all done a risk assessment exercise. Uh, so most of this should be familiar to you, but you know, again, this platform is just uh, and, you know, Or they'll do it and then like, oh, well, um, you know, and, and it's a different level of education there to make them understand it's something you have to stay consistent. With. But, you know, kind of that we need to identify. Okay, we identified our system, we identified our data, we classified what are the risks associated with it. Anything, again, you know where it's housed, you know where it's sitting, there's different risks based on where that information is. So you want to classify it. And we want to identify you know, do we have controls in place? Again, audit will come and work in hand in hand with it because they're going to look at this and say, okay, we're coming to understand this infrastructure. Here's the risk. What controls do you have in place? So if you're missing things off the bat, they're going to identify that and help kind of communicate by appropriate action planning. But at the very least, you can kind of get ahead of that and say, okay, let's ask that question ourselves. You know what the risks are? Do we have something in place to try to mitigate? Um, yeah, if I was a periodic and grouping monitor. Uh, this should be, again, depending on the organization, slightly more frequently than other situations. So, you know, at least annually, but if you can do it on a quarterly basis, or, or if, you know, you know you've got a big conversion plan, the risks are going to change. You should revisit it after that process. And then, of course, the last one, ranking. Again, you want to make sure you know, the, the risk category. So the BIA again, you know, the next step in the school approach is to identify risks. Now you're going to apply that to the data revision process. Um, and sometimes it's something that's classified in a security center plan, but we, you know, we also have a big role in that. So if you haven't gone through and prioritized your business process, this is, this is an impact that which you may have already identified the previous steps. You kind of tie it all together to find that organizational impact. So you want to go and understand what the data review process is like. So, uh, then you can, and some of this may feed into you know, that data classification exercise because you're having those discussions with each other. This is something that you're But you know, you define the defining system, the people that use it, what the business process is out for. Again, what's the, what's the risk assessment for ranking and prioritizing the business process? I got mission essential, you have to find that. That's always been an area where it's just the most debate. Where it's without 10 primary business plus and 800 missions essential. It's like, I can't do this. So, you know, you want to make sure that it's classified correctly. Again, you could apply for it. And then lastly, making sure you put on the coverage on the other side. So that from the liability standpoint, you want to make sure it's great to recover.
So, you know, we, we're getting to the next step now where we kind of built out and understood what the infrastructure has, what our controls are, what the risks are. I talked about here, there may be relevant to your organization, may not. Be. Those organizations have some kind of regulatory standard for uh, compliance requirements that they need to meet. Uh, this is often the tool we try to kind of help organizations you know, uh, build out and understand. It. You, know, you develop a matrix of your controls, your activity associated with it. If it's been tested against, if it's from an audit standpoint, if it's self assessment, any, any of those, it doesn't have to be. When you test it, it's that important from a timing standpoint so you know how, how often you're revisiting that control <clears throat> to make sure that you know, so nothing's changing back. And then lastly, you know, do a revision. Uh, and I'll kind of cover some of this some of these frameworks here in a second. But, you know, you can kind of see again in a quick report in a short format which standards are relevant to organizations. So again, uh, it says help from an audit standpoint, but then also from the information standpoint. Like Manton says, hey, what do we need to comply with? We've done this exercise to share with talk about providing things that you need to implement for them so they can help. Tools and measures like this to try to get you strong strength and security. I won't spend too much time on this. Most people have heard, I mean, start with the IT frameworks. Those are just, they just released 2019. So that's in the process of some people that have been uh, You know, that's talking to public utility companies like that. Uh, we put that one out. I said 27,000 series. And the people in security professional community that as our missing line. Obviously, those are the two primary ones that you know, most organizations try to implement um, some kind of control around. Uh, more of the uh, business side, solving doxy, control protocols. Thanks for taking a lot for that. Uh, and, uh, you know, again, this, this is a lot of uh, evaluating the importance and the accuracy of compliance. Make sure you have property, proper access control, proper security control for founders. Uh, environments helps to increase the confidence of the plan. Uh, HIPAA, again, in the healthcare industry, make sure you listen to those information. Uh, and then the, 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 the SOC, I would say, is most important to search for doctors. If you're a doctor, so there's a customer who's going to be confident in uh, your organization's control environment, then you know, the SOC is going to help out that person to get search for you. But again, if that's something that is applicable to you as an organization, Few more PCI uh, credit card industries primarily focus on the industry providing banking and credit dealing with credit card payments. They have to meet that standard. Uh, FedRAMP, you know, more on the cloud based credit card payments. And then one of the more recent ones, GDPR. It's about a year, almost a year now um, that this has been rolling out. But you know, the biggest thing to say here uh, not everybody can, can comply with it. You'll have your US data center in a European uh, data center, which Again, a lot of people do have that situation, but the big thing here is fees uh, and penalties. I think it's uh, our, I got the number right, like four percent of your annual revenue. It's some ridiculous number that nobody wants to pay. Four percent of your global, yeah, global, yeah, global revenue. So, I mean, you know, then you convert that to, to euros. I think that's the cost. Um, just again, you know. Most people are familiar with the SANS is one, they're the NIST, but they've all kind of created and crafted very similar fashion for framework. But um, yeah, the top 20 is a good uh, resource to kind of take. Again, the audit can help uh, analyze these controls, and I'll look at a couple other topics here to wrap up. But uh, the SANS top 20 is a good way to, to identify some of the more critical areas in the organization. It's everything down from your, your <coughs> devices. Software, baseline configurations, dynamic vulnerability assessment, uh, email, you know, web browser protection. Again, I won't go through each of those in depth, but you can see where, from the technical aspect, this is a good. Uh, this is a good one to use. I guess most people are beginning to implement some of the controls in place, but you also want to make sure you've got some confidence to make sure that you've got some issues. There's a few more here. Um, really, with this one, I want to touch on is again something specific that 
monitoring your environment. So many stories can be told just by doing you know, this process. Uh, obviously, and it's up here that we're server database and application logs. Uh, you know, and there's a common theme about you know, user activity logs and what's going on and the upfront of what type of uh, resources you need to manage. But this is a good way to, you can have SIM tools, you can have various technologies that, again, provide that picture for you. So quickly monitor and see. Do I have servers that want catch current? Do I have, uh, you know, is somebody logging in at four in the morning that you know, doesn't need to be logged in at four in the morning? They're not getting locked out. You know, so again, uh, nothing new here, but you know, so stop it, you know, monitoring is helping to get better. Uh, you know, in some ways, you know, you've got resources that you want to catch on this, but it's making it easier to know where they sign up. This one's going to be each thing separate from here that they're like, oh, I don't have to. I don't have to use the manpower or the tools or something you should try to do. Uh, some other ways to monitor. The reason why I say help desk tickets is um, if you check them sometimes, you might get a story out of that. Is there, uh, again, your other logs might provide it, but you know, is there the same account that continuously gets logged out? Why is this happening? You can look at the trends that. Kind of come up with help desk tickets to see, okay, there's something I need to pay more attention to because it keeps occurring and maybe there may be something going on in that file. User surveys. Uh, why this is important is uh, if you find out, especially in the technology area, that we have disgruntled employees, it might cue you into, okay, uh, my numbers are low, I need to go and see uh, what's going on. Again, in IT, oftentimes people have uh, privilege access. And if there's somebody that's disgruntled and don't try to at least make sure you have the control of what they can be. Uh, I was I talked to one guy in the organization that could let go of uh, the database administrator and they just shut his access off that way. Fired off a, a continuous loop and it basically shut down their service because it just kept on working. I don't know what one of the actually the control now. Yeah. If you say oh uh code. Like, yeah, so I mean, you know, there's there's things, uh, there's risks like that that you need to know. And then again, just looking at our how are part of those are. So, you know, good starting point if you're brand new to the organization and you're in that nice little you know, you know, where some risks may be. Look at the audit report. You might have identified some of the Um, you know, just what about criminal uh, control assessment? I can't stress enough, you know, again, some people don't like dealing with audit, but they can be a great ally, uh, especially if they're not in the organization. They can find that second set of eyes, and they, in some cases, you know, audit shops are getting more sophisticated with their skill sets and you know, can provide that independent site. Uh, you know, and, and even, you know, you may be able to work into obviously audit needs to maintain that independence, but. There are things that you know, they may be able to provide. Uh, some of support is just for monitoring, which we're picking with monitoring. So um, you know, keep that in mind. Always have a plan. Just you know, wanted to close out with examples of audits. Uh, you can do a comprehensive organization wide general control audit that's going to look at things for organizationally. Uh, you know, information security, logical security, critical access control, uh, change management control. And this might be a good starting point, but still, and then let uh, work with audit to identify at a grand scale you know, how our servers could be handled. They might look at it more from the perspective of the attached to the audit plan. Is that possible? Is that possible to solve? Um, you know, these administrative controls, you know, we have 4,000 people living in, and I don't know if that many, but you know, if, if they can look at this independently, again, and can provide um, feedback. Uh, application audit is going to get more into the people level. So, again, we talked about making sure you, know, you classify your systems, you identify the sensor, but uh, you know, auditing those systems as well. Auditing your network is going to be good. The first line of defense, but you, know, you also want to make sure endpoints and applications don't get stored in network resources because you can get um, you've got uh, classified information in there and you have a lot of security controls. You know, 
have to analyze that assessment. Uh, and then lastly, I want to talk about the, uh, the most popular one. Cybersecurity Log is a great tool uh, where, again, you kind of analyze the percentage and then you review your processes, work with you, and identify where you have some flaws and weaknesses. But you may have a strong problem, that's, that's great. Uh, I mean, hopefully, that is the case. But you know, everybody's got some area of improvement. Uh, you know, hopefully, uh, we can try to work through it. And whether, again, whether you do a self assessment or we are providing the uh, slides in the back of the So that wraps up the internal process again. Hopefully, there's a lot of the things you may be familiar with, but hopefully, there's some things that we did that kind of take you to take that to the bridge. But transitioning now. Uh, I kind of think about internal belly is going to talk about things from the third party risk standpoint, making sure that you have proper IV in case of the So, uh, IT third party risk management or vendor management. Um, so, nowadays, uh, business of the outsourcing is, uh, I, I think we all know that. And if implemented correctly, it's a great thing. Um, it's easier to manage, more effective, certainly more affordable. Um, however, just because we outsource uh, doesn't mean we're no longer accountable for how the data. I think a lot of times folks um, may feel that they sign a contract so that the responsibility is off their shoulders and now the contract um, stipulates that the responsibility is now in that third party. However, um, your organization needs to do its due diligence. Um, so, in the past couple of years, uh, that's something I've been doing with some organizations, develop and execute vendor management programs. Um, and for this next section, I'm going to do a walk you through um, a few steps on how you can develop and or mature your vendor management program. Here's how we're going to do it. Are we going to talk about the how? How to develop and mature your IT vendor management program? How to define the expectations of your policies and procedures? How to identify who your vendors are and build out a vendor profile? Uh, identifying their interface. Uh, how to assess your vendors? And we'll go over a few options on how you can assess your vendors uh, and thereby identify your control risk. Um, how to uh, How to identify. Then we say, I'm sorry if I skipped this. How to assess your vendors. Uh, we'll go over the few options there for identifying control risk. And then lastly, we'll go over how to report to your vendor, your vendor management program. So there are really two pieces of that report. One, you're going to report back to your vendors, um, tell them, uh, let them know what you're doing right, what they need to remediate. And you're also going to report to upper management, reporting your residual risk. Uh, just so that well in some case, your residual risk. Your inherent risk um, has been reduced by so first let's talk about defining defining uh, vendor management why it's important and what are the requirements. Um, defining vendor management policy really detailed intelligence program. That's the expectation of the vendor management policy. So we have to start with due diligence. How are we going to better business during the pre-selection pre process? Uh, how are we going to onboard them once they are selected? How are we going to assess our vendors and provide oversight uh, while they are uh, using their services? And I'll be more on that. Um, we also have to think ahead. We have to think of the, uh, the end game there. When we discontinue our relationship with our vendors, what happens? How do we all for? How do we ensure the data that they have in custody is destroyed? For example, uh, if you require a certificate of your structure, you think about um, you know, the other uh, These are the types of questions we should be asking ourselves uh, when building out a vendor program policy. 
So we move on to the um, identified uh, section after we define that program. So once we define our policy and procedures, we want to identify who the leaders are. Let's get, um, let me just see actually, a show of hands. And how many of us know who our organization's vendors are and which ones manage our data? And if that's not your goal, that's fine. Um, how many of you think you know that your organization is tracking the data? Oh, okay. Let's see. It's, it's, definitely, it's, uh, it's certainly important. So we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about that. Um, in this identification phase, uh, this is where we want to identify all the vendors. We build out a vendor, vendor inventory. Work with the sponsoring business unit to understand the sensitivity of the data to determine how critical the, rate, uh, the company is on the vendor organization and build out the profile of each of the vendors. This allows us to assess the inherent risk uh, of the vendors proposed to the organization and the vendors we should work with. Uh, as well as that, the inherent risk of the vendors as a level of risk associated uh, to the process or activity uh, in the absence of mitigating uh, controls. Uh, so really important to that's the All right, so now, now we've identified where our vendors are. So what's the next step? The next step is that we're going to assess it. And Vendors, we've identified vendors, and we have a good idea of the inherent risks associated with them at this point. But now what we really want to determine is what controls they have in place to protect our data. That's super important. Uh, we can prioritize our assessments. For example, uh, if you have a vendor that has critical information, then we prioritize them over some of the uh, lower priority data, or less sensitive. Uh, and we can uh, perform these assessments in many different ways and different ways. A lot of it depends on what uh, the resources within your organization and how you have that particular organization. Uh, we can require a self assessment questionnaire to be filled out by the vendor that's kind of you know, the, the lower level, at least it gets them on record um, attesting to their own uh, environment. Uh, we can then step up and have an on site assessment or audit where we send folks out to do um, assessments. Uh, we have a, uh, like a third party do that for the organization. Uh, that's something that we do for clients at PhD and um, that provides service uh, for our clients. And we can also rely on vendors independent IT audit report to sign up for. Um, we need to know the limitations of what our vendors will allow us to do. Depending on the side of our organization and the resources like this talk about, that'll help decide what, what you can do, what, what you can throw at this assessment phase. Um, there's uh, also, depending upon who you're working with, if you're working with the Googles and the AWSs of the world, um, you uh, may only get from them uh, a soft report, a report like that. And that's fine. Uh, at least you're doing your due diligence, at least you have something on record that uh, I want to perform, and you understand there's exposure to your organization and, uh, and has a wide partner to work with you. So you definitely want to do that assessment. Which then leads us to the reporting phase. Once we have the assessment, we need to report. Who do we report to, right? We report to the vendor, we review the list of issues with the vendor and create an engagement plan with them. Uh, that is kind of out. That's so important. Uh, this is where you can hold vendors accountable to create engagement issues. Uh, you can use uh, in a risk register, uh, as you mentioned, it's a ERC tool or a spreadsheet. Uh, you should also report back to your upper management for future steps. And the vendor's profile. At this point, we didn't need to make a business decision for this uh, assessment. If you continue service, everything's great, they've got everything basics. Um, you sever the relationship because they 
it's a free flow as far as your data is concerned. Or only in the middle, you continue your service uh, with them if there's been a contingent or remediation of the issue. And if it's the uh, latter of the three, you follow up with the vendors to ensure that they remediate the issues of the product. Hold your vendors over there to be I don't have to tell you what the history of this is. So, uh, that's probably what I'm going to make sure that I get done. So, this was certainly a big and kind of a high amount of four steps of vendor management. Uh, but I'm hopeful that you found it helpful. Um, I think what we'll do now is turn it back over to Peter, who will kind of give us a wrap up of uh, a couple of our practical questions. Thanks, hey, So, just in conclusion here, I'm just, you know, to the, the course of discussion that you know, cyber security attacks are becoming numerous and they're becoming more advanced. They're, they're almost on a daily basis. Um, you know, threats can be internal or external. We'll bring it various ways. Uh, we've got malicious attacks, malicious tweets, false attack activists. That, you know, that, so, um, companies have pressing needs to protect their security against such information as talked about the regulatory requirements, external external control requirements for protecting sensitive data, uh, reputation of uh, Establishing an information security program is critical to provide a key of insight into how you can start to build that out in the organization or at least start asking the question. Uh, and you know, that can go a long way in terms of that protecting. Uh, you know, having risk mitigation strategies for integrated to the cyber technology uh, is a required resource to do that. Uh, and lastly, we really touched on, you know, kind of the importance of that third party such as risk management and other strategies you can use to make sure that you're able to prevent the technology from meeting the requirements of the With that, any questions? Yeah, so on the third party side, um, so in all of my RFPs and all my contracts, I have a, a line that states you must be compliant with all my security standards. They're out there for the public's view, and it's about ten different standards, and they all are about two hundred pages each. So it's about thousand plus pages that someone has to say they they're agreeing to when they sign that contract. Um, but more often than I would like to see uh, these vendors like I identify an issue hey you're not doing this um, and they're like well we didn't agree to that <laughs> but you put you signed the contract saying you're going to comply with all my standards um, and so how is there any recommendations on how I could ascertain that they actually understand those standards and what they are actually agreed to so I'm thinking, in my experience, the, the contract you talked about, like that, one pretty that. Um, and, and I'm sure there, there's plenty of others out there. Um, well, what, what we look for are really just kind of the, the, the heavy hitters that you would expect in a contract to make sure that, that, that they're being hit. Um, confidentiality data, um, are they assuring that um, things I can't write down? And that you would want to hit your assessment. Um, you want to know is the level of encryption uh, for data in transit, data rest, you know what that is, uh, access to this information, what are they doing that? Uh, what about do they have vendors that have access to your data? How do, they, how do they assess their own vendors? Things like that. So while the contract's great, what we do is we go visit. Uh, with our clients that use on a, a scheduled basis, uh, depending upon priority of the item that they hold, if it's critical, highly uh, critical, et cetera, by the law. You go there with a questionnaire uh, based on, on controls, and I will, I will go through the controls uh, with their uh, IT management and look at their documentation and within a couple of days or so, uh, go through each one of the controls. Had to show it to me um, so that I can so that I can so that I observe that. However, 
you have to have the manpower for that. Not everyone does. So at the very least, what we uh, recommend is to have a self-assessment question where even if you have that list and you had you send that list over, then had to attest to it. Um, that's maybe a little bit easier for them to understand than you know the very pages of the contract and then uh, the things that are final to you, you know, or hit or not hit. Oh. The channels, we've done business together. Yep. Right? Your, your recourse is a CAI contract. If you have a vendor that you've entered into an agreement with to do, let's say, a risk assessment or security audit, that vendor has entered into a contract not only with you, but with CAI. Right. So I, I'm talking beyond the CAI, CAI contract. I'm talking more on like our RMPs for a new application or a vendor to support an application that's on our servers. So one of the one that's come up recently is, hey, here's your vulnerability report for the application that you support on our servers, ran by Vita. You have uh, several, I'm not going to list the number, but it's, significant amount of vulnerabilities, you need to have these resolved by 90 days based on our security standards. And they're like, well, we can't do that. Is this CGI? No. Third party hosted application? No, it's internally hosted. It's just external based application. So Vita scans it for us, provides a report. And they're like, well, how can we resolve these in 90 days? Well, you agree to it. I don't care how you do it. So it's like, well, didn't you read the standard before you signed the contract? And what did they say? Uh, I still haven't had a chance to talk with them in person, so, or even by phone. I'm having the business handle it before I get angry at these contractors. <laughs> but it's kind of irritating that, you know, you say, are you agreeing to these standards? And they don't look understand what the standards actually say and it's not like it's anything beyond normal it's just 153. I've seen I've seen the same problem in the in DOD where they'd be outsourcing to an, another organization within DOD to host you know doing the fed ramp stuff and stuff like that where they agree to provide you certain controls and it's a small subset of all of the controls and they throw all the rest on you yet they're not willing to sit there and prove to you how they're doing those controls okay and because you're going between one government agency to another government agency a lot of times they just basically say we don't have to tell you how we're doing it we're just telling you we're doing it yeah. to me when, when the one DOD agency outsources to that agency, they should demand that they be able to prove that, okay? Because if they don't, then how do you know what you're getting? You don't know that they're protecting your data the way they say they are. I deal with, I deal with you. So we have, um, so what is security at the higher level level? level. Okay. So uh, they assume responsibility for the pile of so. Okay, so how do I know that they are enforcing or doing what's necessary to meet those controls? Because they're, because they're watching me like, oh, they're, they're scanning me and like what I'm doing. They're, they're, they're scanning they're, you, but you can't scan them. No, yeah. So how do you know that they're doing their due diligence? Well, I, I, I don't. But I, but so you, you're going on good faith based on an ATO, the ATO which is a the, piece of paper. Yeah. We all know how that works. Yes, do. <laughs> if it's operational, they're not going to shut it down. I've had I've had systems that were thirty percent compliant receive ATO, which is unbelievable. 
but I know I know what was possible. If, if they assume responsibility for the fire like themselves, then then somewhere in the contract it says that. And that way that's their problem. And also I am not familiar with these contracts too, but some, some but something that we've seen in contracts too is a right to audit fraud, yeah. which which gives you the right to, to audit what they're doing. And that's certainly Okay. Yeah, but I, I don't think that happens. I don't think that. So I've seen it But so this is the idea. So you have so this is this is the defense station agency. They set the rules. From there, there's a whole uh, R and R. There's A tab, and this one is generally A tab, and capsule. HPSS. HPSS. Well, HPSS. Well, HPSS. Staff The staff is, I mean, the staff is the state. 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 The staff is the The staff is the The staff is the state. 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 In the official, in the official DOD, I've heard of it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and I know it years ago, don't be But anyway, so, so there's a whole part of that process, and they go through all the controls, and they go through all, so if you're in Tokyo data, so they're going to go through all the controls and say, okay. Um, and then they're going to drop down with their arm, so my manager, uh, to where they are. So right now we're, we're I'm in the process of moving from one data center to another. So in this process, so they're they're saying, and so they're they're taking ownership on the actual system. The data center is the first of the system right now. The third data center I I have the AD I have the CSS I have the whole thing. It's, it's, it's a bubble. Like everything is just as far as Server infrastructure and the web applications, the that bubble, and the firewall, and the So there's no, there's no DOD or UFO tax directors or whatever that there is tax directors. Everything else is that bubble. And I still get it, and I'm, I'm constantly praying to people, I'm trying to explain to people that I really don't need you. Nobody's getting in here. You can't get in here. You know, I have to, I literally have to log in onto a government laptop, VPN into a system, jump to a system box, and then I can actually log in for one of my users. And really, you know, that's, that's my way in. So, uh, you're not getting to the system for that computer. Uh, Never say never. Right. <laughs> right. Say. I'll give you a thousand dollars if you can get it. Dub, 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 dub. Does anybody else have any other questions? No. I'd like to give them a big hand. Thank you for presenting. And on behalf of the Chamber, an official challenge coin for both of you. You all. Okay. All right. Um, oh, and I'm sorry, I'm going to say one more thing. Reiterate what Peter said. Uh, Ivan has those slides, so please reach out to him if you'd like to add those. Yes. Um, and we'll, we'll be posting them to our website. And I'm going to leave um, some cards up here. Uh, if anybody has any follow up questions, please reach out to me. We want to take a quick break or a bathroom, bio break. Uh, everybody knows where the bathrooms are. <clears throat> We're right down the hall. A um, couple of uh, housekeeping uh, items that I need to cover. The scholarship challenge is well on the way, well underway. Um, so far, we have only raised $400 um, out of the $10,000 goal that we have. So if you're interested, uh, make sure that you make a donation as an individual or make sure your, your employer knows that we, we have a scholarship challenge going on. 
last year we raised over our goal uh, and that was because we had major heavy hitters and then towards the end we had one individual challenge the rest of the membership uh, and we went over the goal so nope we fell short we exceeded the previous year right we had a goal of 7,500 last year, and we only made 51, something like that, 56, something like yeah. All right. <laughs> we didn't meet our goal last year. We didn't meet it this year, though. Okay. Yeah. Uh, I'm still in conversations with my new employer on uh, getting them to make a donation. Same I know here. That Luma, sorry. Serga. Serga. Lumas uh, rebranded or merged with another company. The Segra, a, something like I'm that. Sorry, Segra. I think Segra. It is. Segra. Uh, they are on board for this year. We're still trying to get Roger Grumman to um, contribute this year as they did last year. Uh, that is an empty situation because Roger Grumman is divesting all of their projects within the Commonwealth of Virginia, so we don't know. Um, but if you have employers that you can reach out to, we would greatly appreciate that. It goes to a good cause. Last year, we ended up awarding um, five $1,000 scholarships to local uh, high school students. Uh, so it, it's for a good cause. And the scholarship challenge is up on our website. All right. Without further ado, um, so I just want to get people over. I'm sorry. I just want to get people by, by over. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> you said that. that you said something. You continue talking. <laughs> um, when you come back, we'll do the yeah. stump the chop. By the way, it's it's yeah, yes. Top control style. It's not safe. Stop. Yeah, I know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, we have a CIS in the primary. They updated it. I want to say something. Yeah, we have Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Hey, Julie, Angela, if you wish to stick around for Stump the Chump, you're welcome. Uh, if you don't plan on sticking around, um, we can certainly end the recording and